Okay, good afternoon and uh, welcome to today's uh, Bloomberg webinar, How Russia-Ukraine Crisis Impacts the Stock 600 and Key Sectors. I'm Roger Thompson, BI's EMEA Regional Marketing Analyst, and it's a pleasure to bring this webinar to you today from the BI team. First from the team, I'd like to say that our thoughts are with everyone in Ukraine on this challenging day. Today's webinar is aimed at helping you think through some of the fundamental investment implications of the latest developments. Over the next 30 to 40 minutes, you will hear from six to seven or seven of our analysts. A few housekeeping items I want to make clear at the beginning. Uh, we are going to be recording this event. We encourage questions, so please enter them in the Q&A box, and we'll do the Q&A session at the end. And uh, please reach out to the analysts directly after the webinar if you have further questions and want to go into some of the data sets that they will be using in their presentations. But before we get going, I would like to spend two minutes on Bloomberg Intelligence. For those of you less familiar, BI is a research division within Bloomberg and can be found by typing BI Go into the terminal. BI delivers independent investment research on companies, industries, and global markets. With over 400 analysts, um, BI is focused on short to medium term investment research, sharing insights on 2,000 companies, 600 credits, 135 industries, and 30 commodities, along with over 20 markets. We're a data-driven um, research project uh, and have over 500 data contributors filling into the dashboards. BI also has unique coverage of ESG, government and litigation, on top of the more usual strategy, equity, and credit that you'd expect. So please reach out to me to learn more about Bloomberg Intelligence. Reach out to the analysts to take a deeper dive into the various industries that we're covering today. We provide no recommendations, but timely, actionable analysis of trends and critical themes. I would now like to hand over to Tim Craighead, Senior European Strategist. Over to you, Tim. Yeah, thank you very much, Roger. I appreciate it, and uh, it's nice to be here, um, unfortunate as it is. Um, so let's get started briefly at the European equity market level uh, before delving into economics and industries, etc. cetera. Our, our basic view is that there are several fundamental drivers that have been and continue to be of overarching importance, and these include things like earnings growth, sustainability, inflation, profit margin, central bank policy. And it, it makes sense to think about how the Ukrainian-Russian crisis impacts these drivers. And to do this, we think about scenarios. And there, there are three, that, three primary scenarios that, that come to mind as, as we explore this situation. One is a relatively limited conflict um, that includes Western sanctions and maybe some responses from, from Russia, um, but again, limited. The second is a broader um, invasion or incursion, attack, what have you, that, that takes on more aggressive actions from the standpoint of sanctions, responses, and importantly, starts to affect energy supplies and material supplies, which in turn affects growth and protect policies, et cetera. And the, the third is, is a negotiated settlement, and, and hopefully we still have an option of getting there, but that brings us back to relative calm, underlying trends resume, et cetera. Now, we're arguably somewhere between number one and number two, depending on how you're reading uh, the news flow, and the market is reacting accordingly. So if you take a look at performance um, on the next slide, on a year-to-date basis, um, those core drivers that I mentioned, I think, are at work. Um, if you look at the pullback that we've seen since early January, it hasn't been a traditional risk-off correction. Um, Europe has fallen um, notably less than the U.S. since the peak. And industry performance is following suit. Things like energy, basics, and banks, which are not always common uh, performers, 
are benefiting from things like rising rates and higher commodity costs. In contrast, tech, industrial, chemical, consumer products are the worst of the lot. And those are either at high multiples, are they're purchasing inflating costs, or worse, that, uh, both of those things. Now, the Ukraine-Russian situation is accentuating a lot of these movements, and it could do more. Um, look at the commodity markets today. It's across the board, oil, gas, metals, grain. They're all up big. Um, and what it's proven, at least in the current market, is that it's good to produce commodities. It's bad to purchase them. Um, the big outstanding question in our mind over the near term is what happens to interest rates? You know, they've been moving up. It's been pre propelling certain elements of the marketplace. If we see moderation in interest rates and things like banks and insurance, sentiment could also moderate. We'll see where this goes. Now, if you think beyond performance, let's look briefly at European valuation on the next slide. We all know that valuation is a, is a generally a positive attribute for Europe. Um, it's fallen a lot um, over the course of the last couple of quarters as earnings have risen. This is true on both an absolute basis, where we're now down back below 14 times forward earnings for the stock 600, as well as relative to the U.S. It's, it's down very sharply. Um, one more slide, you'll see a different perspective on valuation, comparative valuation, and this is equity risk premium. Um, it again shows Europe to be in a very favorable position versus the Europe by, by versus the U.S. by a wide margin, and offers some sense of support to get us through these types of turbulent times. Sometimes we'll see equity risk premiums spike higher than they are right now, but it tends to be short lived. Um, so over the next couple of days, we're going to be looking at things like technical elements of the sell-off and screening the markets for very, on various fronts to explore different ideas. And you'll find that on the last slide here, Roger, all our analysis is up on BI Stocks E. Hopefully, uh, you can find some interesting uh, interesting insights there. And we look forward to, to being in touch. Uh, let me turn things over to Scott Johnson now uh, from our economics team to give you his thoughts on the uh, on the overall outlook and the wake of these developments. Scott? Thank you, Tim. Hi, everyone, and, and thanks for joining us. Um, Obviously, events are moving very quickly. Uh, everyone's thinking about scenarios, uh, and, and last night we published uh, four scenarios, and we sadly lost the most optimistic cases overnight. Um, so now we think that the impact on growth, uh, inflation, interest rates really boils down to what happens with the, the energy markets. Um, so we see three ways this might play out for the global economy. Uh, first, uh, assumes no disruption to uh, energy supplies. and um, uh, we can see this a little bit on the next slide, but uh, I'm afraid I don't have it illustrated. Um, the second scenario sees uh, some disruption, and that's, that's certainly plausible, and we may hear more about this later. There are reports of oil tankers avoiding Russian crude until they have more clarity on sanctions. Uh, conceivably, major gas pipelines could be hit in the fighting. Um, lastly, the, the most extreme case uh, sees Russia cutting off gas supplies to Europe. So clearly Ukraine has the most at stake, um, but the implications for Russia's economy are, are quite severe. Um, so we expect the toughest sanctions to date, uh, likely on banking and trade. Uh, those will come later today and probably in broad strokes, but we may see details trickle out over the near term. Uh, we're assuming Russia won't be cut off from Western markets completely, but that is in the spectrum. Um, I'm sure you're all aware of what's happening in Russian markets. Uh, equities are down uh, about 40% since last week. Uh, credit default swaps have spiked to higher spreads than uh, actually following the annexation of Crimea back in uh, 2014. And uh, even in the, in the global financial crisis, they haven't been this wide. Um, prices in Asia for Russia, well, it's likely to be even more financial turmoil than we've seen. Uh, higher inflation, uh, higher interest rates, and a big hit to growth. Uh, recession is likely at this point. Uh, the further Putin goes, the deeper the hole, uh, the slower the recovery. For Europe, um, the main channel of the impact is really energy prices. So if, if costs stabilize from here, then the extra inflationary pressure looks limited, and the ECB could stay on its current course for, we think, a rate hike in December. Uh, if energy spikes further, um, the euro area could see a mild recession, and that would be in the case of uh, a little bit more disruption in, in energy markets. Um, lastly, if, if Russia takes the unlikely step of uh, switching off the gas, then a deeper recession could uh, potentially de delay ECB liftoff. Uh, 
for the U.S., um, well, the U.S. is further away. Um, it's a little more uh, removed. Uh, and, and we don't think that this, what we've seen so far, is going to be enough to postpone a Fed rate hike in March. Um, but if we look a little further ahead in um, you know, a global risk-off scenario, then uh, this could shift the Fed onto a more dovish path as policymakers look through the, um, you know, the spike in energy prices to the impact on demand. Um, now, we'll have more research coming out on this today. Uh, you may actually not be aware that Bloomberg has a, a team of economists. Um, so just briefly, I'll, I'll tell you where you can find us. Uh, run uh, BECO, BECO, on the terminal, and you'll see links to all of our latest research. Uh, we also have some dashboards with data and, uh, and our forecasts in that. Um, so uh, with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Tomas to uh, talk us through the impact for banks. Thank you very much, Scott. I hope you can hear me well, guys. Uh, Robert, can you? Uh, I'm going to focus right now on, on the implication of coming sanctions or new sanctions on the banking sector, on Russian banking sector, but also European banks. So the way we look at the sanction that has been introduced uh, this week on Wednesday, we consider those sanctions as a weak sanctions, light sanctions. But the, the way we interpret this is a message for Vladimir Putin, the government, that more targeted sanctions are on, in, are possible in the in coming days even following the invasion today, and these sanctions will be much more severe for the banking sector and for the economy in general. And when we look at the sanctions that were introduced a few days ago, this is sanctioning the small, not systematically important banks in Russia. These are specialized lenders uh, focusing on military defense or some regional projects, and the total asset of those banks is less than $100 billion, which is four times less than the biggest bank in Russia is Berber, and, two, and more than two times less than the second biggest lender, VTB. So in terms of the scenarios which we are, have to consider right now, more severe sanctions for bank as, banking sector in Russia would definitely be much more painful for, for the whole sector. And we, when we talk about sanctions that could be possibly introduced, I think there are four which are most most uh, severe one for the whole sector. One of those would be the classification of the of the companies in Russia, banks as well, as the special designated national by U.S. Department of Treasury. The other one is the banning key, Russian banks and companies from accessing U.S. financial markets, dollar market. Third one is the disconnect from the SWIFT messaging system, which we consider low probability given the implication for the global partners. And finally, it is introducing the export controls uh, for Russian economy. And this, for banks, the most important would be the tech export controls. So when we talk about financial markets, so access to dollar financial markets, it doesn't seem to be a big, uh, big, uh, big problem for, for Russian banks, maybe, because they don't rely on dollar funding as much. However, the, 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 the issue for the companies can be very significant, and access to funding in near term can cause uh, massive destructions. If it comes to the special designated national, national SDN status, it's, it's going to be very painful, not only for the banks, but also for all the other global companies that want to do and deal with Russia, because this, this can expose them to sanction risk on the U.S. And lastly, when we talk about disconnect from SWIFT, we believe that this will be very difficult to introduce, given the global ties. The Russian economy is very much interlinked with global global economy. So and any any limits on settling bills in dollars by Russian uh, companies and uh, their global partners could have very significant impact, not only for Russia, but also for uh, all the other nations. And lastly, when we talk about export controls, I think it is very important to notice that the Russian banks have been very massively progressing on digitalization. They've been using lots of IT software solutions to make those banks one of the most digitalized and uh, in innovative in the world. So any any controls on uh, software chips, uh, whatever hardware they use in the, in the in the in the systems, it can very difficult, very very much slow the progress uh, in that on that front. And when we talk about the sanctions on the recent sanctions on limiting the access for Russia government to to uh, dollar and euro market, we also believe that this is a low risk at the moment, given that Russia is running twin surplus, they, they have very low debt to GDP. Uh, uh, ratios, they have very high FX reserves, using, using that the near term, the financing for Russia government is not a problem. On top of that, of course, we ho also have uh, high oil prices where supporting uh, budget revenues. So in near term, of course, this is not a very huge risk, right? but when you, when you are talking about san sanctioning further sovereign debt market, uh, what we have to think about is, is, is around 40 billion of OFZ held by the foreign residents. And uh, the, the, the risk, what's going to happen with this with these holdings? how it's going to impact global indices and how it's going to uh, impact global financial market. That is definitely something that policymakers are now scratching their heads off. Uh, can we move to the next slide, please? 
So yeah, when we when we look at the Russian banks at the moment, and we look at the Russian banks in 2014, we definitely can say that they have done massively good uh, good job. They massively improved uh, funding, liquidity, and capital positions. Uh, central bank is there ready to support and maintain the financial stability, as we have seen already so happening this week. If you look at like, Russian banks, they rely on FX lending much less than in 2000. Uh, 2000 14, the, the funding structure is much better, loan to deposit ratio is less than 100%, so there is no issue with accessing wholesale funding, something that we've seen in 2014. However, one thing which I think we should be all looking for, looking at at the moment, is the quiet, still relatively quiet, uh, depo high deposit of F F FX deposit with uh, largest bank, uh, Russian banks, Sberbank and DTB. Uh, these account for 26 to 36%. Uh, which is uh, which is which is around 144 billion dollars, right? And now it, it, the question is, what's going to happen with those deposits if Russian residents hear that there are going to be some sanctions banning Russian banks from accessing U.S. financial markets? Are we going to see random deposits? Are we going to see any funding liquidity stresses? That's something definitely we're going to be watching in the coming days, and we also also will be watching what's happening with. Uh, with central bank and what sort of support they're going to provide to uh, Sberbank and VTB and other Russian lenders. Uh, luckily, lastly, uh, it's, it's also worth mentioning that uh, in gen the, the January's data from Sberbank is showing that the, despite global tensions happening at the moment, there's nothing ha wrong happening with Russian banks. They do very good. They have uh, profitability been strong. Credit demand was strong. There's no cracks on asset quality. But, you know, it, it can change very easily in the coming months because the situation is very much deteriorating. And I think it's good mentioning with VTB, which has refrained from providing guidance for 2022, highlighting that the SDN classification is the worst case scenario, it is possible scenario, and they don't really know how it's going to play out for banking sector in Russia. Can I move to the next slide, please? So when we talk about the uh, when we talk about central bank support, so I think it's very important to highlight that central bank has introduced two measures on 18 of a uh, few days ago meaning that the Russian banks can uh, use uh, historical data as of February 18 to evaluate their bond portfolio and their capital. What it means for the banks? Well, it means quite a lot because it's going to protect their capital from the uh, recent moves in, uh, in the ruble and in yields. If you look at the January data, the move in the yields in January cost uh, Russian banks more, almost 250 billion uh, rubles, which is $3 billion, which is massive hit to their capital. And uh, because of those measures, this, this will not be affecting the a future uh, performance of the capital and similar is with the is similar is as well with the fx rate F, that the russian banks they still have around 20 percent of loans in fx so any fluctuation of the currency means that their capital is quite vulnerable to those uh, those developments and lastly i think it's also worth mentioning that if there's any sanction on sovereign debt market the russian russian banks will have to pile up those uh, purchases of OFZ, so sovereign, Russian sovereign bonds, which will make them even more exposed to what's happening with Russia economy. Right now, it's, a, it's a OFZ account for around 10% of total assets, which is quite a lot if you look at EU, European banks, and definitely further purchases will make them more vulnerable to yield spikes. And last slide, please. Yes, yeah, so I would focus right now, I would like to focus on European banks and the exposure of Europe. European banks and potential spillover risk. So as you probably know, French, Italian, and Austrian lenders are most exposed with nearly more than 50 billion of lengths in Russia. Still, uh, we believe that this risk uh, from Russia is quite uh, manageable for most of them, apart from one, which is Austrian lender Raiffeisen, who is, which is uh, generating more than 30% of pre-tax profit uh, from the region. Uh, we generally think that the, the, the banks are very well prepared to deal with the sanctions. Uh, they have quite strong funding and capital position over there. They have hedging to hedge against ruble, uh, ruble movements. So uh, I believe from that perspective, they're quite well prepared. Uh, sentiment gonna be very uh, sentiment is gonna be very weak in coming weeks. So we're gonna see much more pressure on the share price as well probably. And when we look at when we look at the banks. I think uh, definitely Rifan will be the one which we're gonna be uh, monitoring most closely because they have quite a large exposure uh, over there. And we've talked about uh, Sovereign and Unicredit, uh, they are quite big there as well, but their exposure is much less, it's only 4% of revenue, so the risk for those banks is much, uh, much less prof uh, profound. Uh, I will be concluding my presentation right now. If you want to learn more about banking sector exposure and uh, impact on sanctions, please contact me directly. And now I will hand over to Sally to talk us through about uh, an energy and impact on the gas and oil. And uh, thanks everyone for tuning in today. Uh, I'd like to walk you through this 
ever-rising geopolitical risk premium on oil prices with Russia's invasion of Ukraine and how the risk of wider conflict and sanctions far outweigh now the oil upside for Russian oil and gas companies, despite the good uh, commodity price, pricing environment that we have right now. So on the next slide, um, with this geopolitical risk premium that we've been talking about, which many argue may be up to $15 a barrel now, oil prices are now above $100 a barrel, Brent is near $105 a barrel, WTI is also above $100 a barrel. These are, I mean, these prices are up 35% year to date. Generally, this is a good thing for oil and, oil and gas companies, but as you can see here, not so much for the Russian ones. Uh, obviously, there is this huge overhang on these companies now. Shares are all down. Uh, I mean, they were down yesterday, they're down today. I mean, intraday, most are down more than 30% or more. And this is likely driven by potentially more sanctions on more Russian banks, limiting access to funding and payments for these energy companies. And perhaps the increased risk now of uh, disruptions, potential disruptions to oil and gas flows. So on the next slide, um, so this kind of sanctions and sovereign risk is outweighing this oil upside for these energy companies in Russia. And valuations are suffering. When we look at the Russian integrated oil and gas peer group, the forward PE ratio for this peer group is at about 2.3 times, which is less than half of what it is for the global integrated oil uh, peer group average. And any this, any de-escalation of this, I mean, which is looking increasingly unlikely now, uh, could have translated into uh, a notable recovery for these companies, because given there would be no disruptions, uh, these companies are expected to be generating very healthy cash flows this year. On the, on the next slide, um, when we look at the macro outlook uh, for oil prices, we are now very much focused on, the, on this geopolitical risk. And um, I think, and the point, but, but the point here, I think, is uh, that we shouldn't get so, so distracted by the geopolitical risk premium because. Um, and, and the headlines that are driving oil prices right now, because when we zoom out and take a look at the fundamentals for, for this year, regardless of this geopolitical risk, it is still a very strong fundamental setup for the oil market this year. So we have strong demand for oil. We have OPEC plus supply shortfalls. We have falling sub, uh, spare capacity. We have low inventories, which are all combining to create this perfect storm uh, for oil prices this year and will continue to be supportive. So on the next slide, we have the supply-demand balance for oil this year. And on the supply side, we know OPEC Plus is, has been struggling to keep up with these rising targets. They've been targeting to add 400,000 barrels per day every month, but we know many member nations are struggling. On the demand side, I mean, the recovery in demand has really been stunning and all the indicators are pointing to continued recovery. So it will, we think, uh, continue to be a very tight market uh, for, uh, for, oil market, for, for oil this year. So on the next slide, when we look at the spare capacity, which is the cushion that we have against unexpected supply disruptions, which are proving to be present, uh, this spare capacity number is supposed to be at around 5.3 million barrels per day, according to the data that we have on the, on the Bloomberg terminal. Um, but VS, I mean, our scenario analysis suggests that this, uh, the actual number for this may actually be, the sustainable number for spare capacity may actually be lower at around 4 million uh, barrels per day. And I should mention that this spare capacity is very much concentrated in only three countries, that's Saudi Arabia, the UAE, and Iraq. So we really don't have uh, a lot of spare capacity left in the oil market. And when we look at the next slide, our, sense, our base case scenario suggests that we may get an incremental demand growth of about 4.4 million barrels per day this year. This suggests that we actually may exhaust most of the meaningful spare capacity that we have by the end of the year, which means uh, the, the potential uh, Iran deal, the Iran nuclear deal, the potential return of Iranian barrels. And I see someone just asked in the chat as well about how much I think the U.S. shale can come back how much growth there is in output outside of OPEC and uh, especially U.S. shale will be very important 
to balance in the market because without those, it will continue to be a very, very tight market. And in the next slide, when we look at the inventories, uh, inventories are now well below the five-year average, and they're actually below 10-year average now. In some parts of the world, we are talking about tank bottom stocks. And I'd like to remind everyone that we were supposed to be in a surplus in every month of this year, but we are not quite seeing that uh, this year. And so far this year, we've actually been drawing from inventories uh, so far. So to wrap up, uh, geopolitics and the Ukraine headlines, of course, are all supportive of, uh, of oil prices. They are adding this geopolitical risk premium that we've been talking about for a while now. But we shouldn't forget that this is a fundamentally strong uh, market beyond just the near term uh, geopolitical premium. So that's it for me. Thank you very much. And uh, I mean, as always, if you have any questions, we will try to answer them later uh, in this call. But please feel free to reach out to me directly as well. And I will pass it over now to my colleague, uh, Patricio Alvarez, to uh, talk about the gas implications. Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks, Sally. Um, today, I'll be walking you through um, through what the p potential impact on the gas market will be. As the title was, what Will says, uh, Russia's invasion uh, may risk reigniting the, the European gas crisis. And I think the, the first point of order will be discussing Europe's largest uh, gas supplier. Uh, next slide, please. That is, of course, Russia, as everyone knows. Uh, Russia meets, uh, Russian gas flows meet about 40% of European gas demand. And not only that, but Russia has already shown its willingness to use this as geopolitical leverage, as we've seen um, volume steadily decline uh, from, from August through March by about 40% on average. Um, and what this tells us is that the, the market will be um, extremely volatile over the coming days, as just the, the, the news of the actual invasion already pushed um, TTF benchmarks 40% up just today, and they are up also 80% since Monday. So this just shows you the incredible um, level of volatility in gas prices, even though there hasn't been any um, news about the potential impacts of sanctions on actual flows. Uh, we, we just want to highlight that Russia has already suppressed uh, volumes. Um, can we move on to the next one, please? Okay, this is uh, the chart of, of European gas storage. So just as we were getting close to the to the low bound of the five-year norm, meaning that the crisis was set to subside and perhaps we had a chance to recover storage levels into the, the winter of 2022, um, the, the potential threat of, of a suppression of gas flows from Russia definitely will derail this, um, this potential recovery of, of, of gas storage levels, which means that elevated natural gas prices may be here to stay. Um, and this is compounded by the, the scrapping or the cancellation of Nord Stream 2, of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, which was lauded as uh, the, the main supply catalyst for, for this, for later on this year. So both these factors, excluding any potential further cuts, cuts to gas flows, have already set a really, um, really tough scenario in terms of how Europe is going to manage to refill storage levels, especially since elevated prices mean there's no incentive to um, to refill the storage, and we will also have to com uh, compete with Asia for those LNG cargoes. Can we move to the next, please? In terms of prices, uh, as I already mentioned, that we've seen in immense volatility this week on the back of uh, of the events in in Russia and in Ukraine. Um, and the forward curve already seems to have priced in uh, the risk of, of uh, the, the, the halt of Nord Stream 2, as we see in the, in the strong backwardation in the curve, which actually lacks seasonality through the end of this year, which to us means that there's just an incredible amount of, of volatility amongst traders, because the norm would, um, would suggest that we see sort of a, a little fluctuation between the summer and the winter months, as we see on the on the green line, which is the forward curve as it was six months ago, we can see a little bit of fluctuation, but now it seems like all, all the risk is to the upside. Let's move on to the next slide, please. Um, the, the next step is to check um, how these may have, this is going to affect um, utilities or, or upstream producers. Who, who are the com which are the companies that are poised to win and lose? Um, in terms of the utilities, which is a sector that I cover, 
um, elevated gas prices will more than likely increase the the, the price of um, of power, um, and this sort of volatility tends to dislocate the the trading operations of utilities, who find it very hard to to improve their margins when their their fuel um, to to actually fire up their their gas fired generation fleets is so expensive, and this is compounded by also uh, high carbon prices, which make it really hard for them to actually burn coal to make that, to make up for that power that they're losing you know, on gas. All that. Um, convoluted with regulatory hurdles that impede um, utilities to pass on the, the, the rising costs onto customers fast enough. So this will put a significant strain on um, on their balance sheets, at least uh, in, in the near term. And the other point I'd like to note is that German utilities are especially exposed to, to a potential suppression of gas flows from Russia, particularly Uniper and its parent fortune, given they uh, import about 50% of their gas flows directly from Russia. And they are also um, they are also investors in the Nord Stream uh, 2 pipeline, which which could entail significant impairment of, of their uh, of their liabilities and also their expected uh, interest income in the future. Um, let's move on to the next slide. And also there may be um, a set of winners uh, on the back of this crisis. And this uh, this is, uh, seems to be the upstream operators outside of Russia, as these will benefit from from an improving price backdrop uh, in general. Uh, we note Equinor as um, as uniquely positioned in this environment, as as it's the oil major with the least exposure in Russia, and also uh, has the highest is Europe's second largest gas supplier. And, and with that, um, I will hand it over. To, to my colleague Grant Spohr, the, the senior anal, uh, my, metals and minings analyst. And good afternoon, good morning, everybody. Um, so yeah, I mean, the, the upshot of the uh, Russia-Ukraine escalation is that we're probably going to see more um, inflation when it comes to metal prices. So that's a point, uh, just to compound a point that Tim, Tim mentioned, and to, to, to um, hit our sort of decarbonization agenda is, is really going to cost us more. So if I could have the first slide, just to recap, um, I want to make four points on, on this slide. Just to recap, um, a point that Sally made is most of the metals markets are pretty well, are, are pretty tight at the moment. So the supply-demand balance is, most of them are in deficit, um, and we've obviously seen some good price action last year. Um, and this year we've seen uh, a continuation of that. But it's been very much skewed on, on supply-side disruption or the expectation of supply-side disruption. So on the chart, you can see the um, Russia's uh, share of global production with each of the metals, palladium taking uh, you know, close to 50%. And you can see that the metal price performance is almost related to that exposure. Um, there's been some outsized performance on aluminium um, versus uh, Russia's sort of 5 or 6% contribution to global supply. And I think a, a part of that is certainly the, the, the whole energy complex and the inflation there has, this is a second derivative of that. And, but also the nature of sanctions, which I think everybody expected to be focused on either individuals or companies. And we saw that with the, the sanctions in, uh, against Roussel in 2018. So I think that's why aluminium has outperformed. And certainly nickel as well, that has outperformed relative to, to Russia's contribution of about 8% to global supplies. And there, that is a particularly tight market with very low visible inventories. If I could have the next slide, um, just to go through the, the winners and losers, um, it shouldn't be any surprise that anything um, outside exposed to either nickel, platinum group metals, or aluminium has done very, very well. And you can see the equity outperformers there. Uh, versus the metal price, and anything within Russia has been a, a particular you know, has been on the losing end of it. Um, these were prices as of yesterday. Um, so today we've seen um, you know stocks like Ferexpo down sort of 35%, um, and any and even stocks like um, I would I would point out Polymetal, which is which is a gold producer, which should be benefiting, is down almost 45%, um, and that's in contrast to a lot of the other gold peers which are up anything from 1% to 10% globally. So, um, and, you know, I, I, personally, I, we, I see a continuation of that trend going forward. So if I could have the next slide, let's just go into a, a little bit more um, onto each of the metals. So if we look at palladium, 
Look, palladium is the, is the one metal where I actually see the least risk of a prolonged supply disruption. And the reason I say that is twofold. On the supply demand, supply demand balance, yes, indeed, there's a, it's in a deficit today. Um, but we do expect that balance to ease going forward by mid-decade, um, or actually in the next two, three years, we expect it to be either balanced or in a surplus. Uh, and that's rising electric vehicle sales. Um, and secondly, we're also seeing substitution out of palladium, which had a record year last year in terms of prices, into platinum, which is, is, is much more um, fairly valued, um, particularly in Europe's diesel auto uh, sector. And the other one is, uh, um, I think we also need to look at the ability to, 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 to rearrange trade flows globally. If there is uh, a lot um, stricter sanctions, particularly on, on, on Russian metal supply. And for palladium, if we look at it, Russian supply um, has been dwindling, um, and I'll, I'll talk about that when we get to nickel, um, and we've seen some disruptions. But at the moment now, Chinese demand is actually higher than Russian, uh, Russian supply. So there is a, uh, over time, some of those trade flows that come um, outside of Russia could be rerouted through to China, and that would um, sort of balance the palladium market. If I move to the next slide, I'll talk about aluminium. Um, and here the, the, the picture is a little bit different, right? So this is one of the metals where we actually see um, the deficits, uh, you know, it was roughly balanced last year, we start to see the deficits grow in the aluminium market. It's a metal that's been used for light weighting, which obviously saves on on a number of things, particularly in the auto sector, on, on, on uh, fuel consumption. And again, we can see that Russian supplies, you know, used to be close to 10% in a, a decade ago. It's now closer to 6%, mainly because Chinese supplies surpassed that, and that has, there's been a lot of growth. But the dynamics have changed in the aluminium market. Um, whereas China used to be an exporter to the rest of the world of, of aluminium goods, mainly through semi-fabricated products, it's slowly been pulling back. And in fact, on the primary level, China is now a net importer of metal, which um, means that the rest of the world has to make up for that and start expanding its own, um, its own capacity. And Russia was one of the few places that actually had projects, um, particularly Rusal, had projects on the, on, the, on, on the drawing board and were actually developing. And, and we, were, you know, we, we would expect that by 2025, they could increase by almost a million tons. So in effect, um, it's going to be very difficult for uh, Euro Europe and the US to impose sanctions on, on aluminium supply. And we saw the impact of that in 2018 as well particularly on, on, on the aluminum market where there was massive spikes in price because of the disruption of trade flow. So I think it's that the aluminium market is, is, is one that can see uh, further outperformance. If I move on to the last metal, which will be Nickel, um, look, again, it's a tight market. It's really been, again, amplified by Russian supply disruption. And this is even before potential sanctions. So, yes, Russia's um, market share has contracted over the past decade, but it's still the third largest producer um, producing. You know, it's come down from about 260,000 tons to 200,000 tons. Um, and it's mainly through nor nickel. Um, and we can see that its, it's, its market share has declined because um, Indonesia's supply has indeed increased. Um, but if you look at the, the chart, the yellow line is, is Russia's percentage of mine supply. And we can see the dip in 2021. And this, that was really where they were flooding at two of, of, of Nornickel's Arctic mines. And that took out 20 to 30,000 tons out of the market. And that's really tightened it up in 2021. And then something that, that, that you know, mirrors what we saw in the gas market, which Patricia talked about, is in August last year, there was a 15% Russian export tax, uh, tax imposed on metals. And we've seen the, the flow of anything from nickel to copper coming out of, out of Russia really um, being reined back. So again, so that's tightened up the, the, particularly the nickel market a lot more than potentially we would have seen. Um, so the, the tactic by Russia has been, you know, it, it, in the gas market has really been mirrored in the, in the, in the metal markets. So nickel is, again, is, is one of those metals that, that could be tight going forward. And then just on my last slide, you know, I guess we always have to, have to look at 
where commodity markets are positioned. Um, and it kind of mirrors what I've been trying, you know, what I've said is on the New York Mercantile Exchange, you know, palladium positions were actually still net short. But we have seen some of those short positions being closed. And it wouldn't surprise me if we pop into a net long position for a short period of time. And we can see how the, the palladium prices rebounded quite strongly on the back of that. That said, on the LME, both both nickel and aluminium are were, were at record net length um, on the market. And I, I guess yesterday I would have said, well, look, the risk here is that if if we do get a, a speedy resolution, um, we could get a pullback of net long positions and we could see a, a, a quick sell off. Um, today, perhaps my message might be a little bit different. Um, and on that, let me hand over to, to my colleague, Rob Burnett, who's going to take us through renew renewables. Thank you, Grant. Uh, very good to see you in the office wearing a tie. Uh, if you're looking at the market today, you're mostly seeing a sea of red. There are some exceptions to that. If you look at Vestas, they're up about 10% at the moment. Siemens Gamesa up 12%. Nordex up 13% and change. And so what's going on? Why are the clean tech stocks rallying when everything else is uh, hitting a bit of turmoil? Uh, well, if you look at our note out this morning, we think that this crisis could really boost the outlook for clean energy. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. You know, normally I think you think of wind and solar being driven by net zero uh, desires, climate change concerns, this sort of thing. But I think now you can think of energy security as a way to really help to fast track clean energy. And if we could go to the next slide, Roger. Look, I think the markets in many ways are between a rock and a hard place. Uh, if you want to use less gas, I mean, Patricia was just noting the stunning run-ups we've seen in European natural gas prices, you, you have a few options. You can simply do without. That's not a very tenable position. You could burn more coal. Well, that doesn't sit well with the environmentalists. You could keep nuclear power plants going. Uh, we'll, it'll be very interesting to see whether that enters the collective conversation in Germany and perhaps in Europe more broadly. Uh, but there aren't too many options if you want to build something new. And I think the the fastest way to really uh, get a, a, an alternative to a gas molecule coming in from uh, Russia would be to build new wind and solar generation. And I would just note what I've got here on the screen, very cool function called HRA Go. Uh, that's where you can look at the correlations between different instruments. Uh, what I'm showing right now is the correlation between European carbon allowance prices and European natural gas prices. Now, carbon is down today, but over the long haul, there's a pretty strong link between those commodities. So higher natural gas prices pushes up uh, essentially dark spreads for coal plants, which makes you want to run your coal plants more, which drives up emissions and demand for carbon allowances, which pushes up the carbon price. And higher carbon price helps to incentivize wind and solar. So if we could go to the next slide, please, Roger. Um, just quickly, a little bit of background. Uh, we've seen a pretty staggering uh, increase in renewable generation already in Europe over the last five years. Uh, it's currently accounting for about 23% of generation in the region versus 10-14% uh, just, just a handful of years ago. So we're seeing it already climb rapidly. This is because of many factors, it's because the government wants it to happen. It's because the cost for wind and solar has been coming down through time. And if you want to see it keep going up, I think that certainly uh, higher gas prices and potential gas shortages because of the conflict uh, really help to make the case. If we could go to the next slide, I think this will help illustrate why. Uh, it takes time to build new power plants, and if you want to build 
n- new capacity of any kind, the fastest bar none uh, that you can get online and add to the grid is solar. Probably the second fastest, fastest is wind. And if you want to do something like even gas or coal, and I know that's not in vogue, there's nobody really arguing that you should do it, but it's going to take time, many years. Uh, in nuclear power plants, if everything goes right, maybe you can do it in five years, but maybe realistically it's more around 10 years. So it takes time to think of adding other types of electrons to the grid, whereas with the, if you have a solar project, you could essentially have execute a project now and potentially be online ahead of next winter. Some solar projects can be done in as little time as you know, six to 12 months, maybe even less if you're really aggressive. Wind, more like a one to two year range. So I think we're going to see a big sprint to do more clean energy as a way to reduce gas reliance over the next few years. And one more slide from me, I would just say that this outlook is really not baked in to expectations right now. Uh, If you look at consensus for, we'll go back to Vestas here, uh, they grew their turbine deliveries by a CAGR of about 25% from 2017 through 2025. Very stunning pace of growth. But if you look at consensus, Pretty flat for the next few years. I think I think there's a very big potential upward revision that we could see unfold to the consensus outlook, driven by certainly net zero, driven by concerns about emissions, and especially uh, with the focus on energy security. And I think we're going to see renewables be a big part of that conversation here in Europe. So. Uh, very dark times, but hopefully that's a little bit of a uh, perhaps a bright spot on the uh, the conversation and, and perhaps something that could could be a, a nice thing to come out of uh, all, all of the uh, difficulties we're seeing. So I want to turn it back over to Roger to help moderate some Q&A before we close it off. Well, thank you very much, Rob, and to everybody for your questions that I see have started to feed into the chat box. As a reminder, please put more questions in. If we don't get to them all uh, this afternoon, we will absolutely reach out to you with answers, and I'll spread them around the different team. One question was, will we be distributing the slides? The answer is yes to that. They've all been cleared to legal, so I can get them out very quickly after we finish today. Um, I will just maybe start putting a couple of the questions out there to the team. And as I said, you know, please uh, you know, jump in with a few more. We'd love the engagement. And you know, always remember on the top of every dashboard, you, the, you can reach out directly to the analyst, uh, arrange a call, engage in a chat, send a message uh, with, with anything that's on your mind. But uh, it, the first one is the withheld production from OPEX plus part of your spare capacity calculation, probably to you, Sally. Sure. Thanks, Roger. I mean, I see a couple of questions uh, on oil, and I'll try. I'll try to take all of them. Uh, so that one, I mean, I think that's a good question on uh, whether the withheld production from OPEC Plus is in the spare capacity. Yes, it is. I mean, this is really the majority of the of the spare barrels that we have at the at the moment. And so, the, so the answer to that question is yes. Um, the other one was, what if Iran sanctions are erased? I mean, as I, as I mentioned, this is obviously very important and will be very important to, uh, to balance the market this year. We expect between 1 to 1.3 million barrels per day uh, of extra supply that Iran can bring back to the market within 9 to 12 months if we did get uh, a nuclear deal. Um, and um, the other question was if, whether Shell can help balance the market. And I think it all feeds into the same equation in that, I mean, we, to balance, we really would need that extra barrels from, uh, uh, from, from Iran. And also we would need a notable increase in nanopack production, especially U.S. shale. Our base case scenario analysis suggests about 800,000 barrels per day of increase from the U.S. in 2022. And we expect an even bigger supply reaction next year as these high prices can incentivize uh, more projects and more production. But I think the, the important point to make here is that, yes, I mean, probably we will have enough barrels to balance the market this year, 
but we should also be thinking about what that means to spare capacity. Because this is, I mean, there was a time when the oil prices were, were, were priced on, on spare capacity. And, and, and there's a reason for that, because as I mentioned, this is the buffer that we have against further supply disruptions, which, which, which are events that can happen. So while we can balance the market this year, we can see that spare capacity number fall to alarming levels. And what this normally does is it really makes the market very, very anxious. So the more nervous uh, the market gets, uh, the more upward push pressure there might be for, for uh, oil prices. So uh, I, I mean, those are three questions that I could see uh, that, 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 that I, I, hope, I hope I could answer. Uh, if there's any more, please, uh, please go ahead and put them on the chat. Yeah, thank you very much, Sally. I see there's a few questions, not surprisingly, probably for you, Patricio, on Nord Stream 2. Uh, I know a U.S. government official described it overnight as 11 or $12 billion of steel now lying redundant in the bottom of the ocean. Uh, a bit harsh, I think, uh, but can Europe replace the gas supply or how, how will it replace the gas supply? Sure, thanks, uh, Roger. I think what's important to note um, is that uh, gas flows from Russia have already been suppressed by about 40% on average since um, since the end of uh, the third quarter of 2021. So we've already been experiencing this, experiencing this curtailment of gas flows. Um, what what the removal of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline does is dash the hopes of having this incremental supply that would have helped us balance the market. Um, this year and probably help us also uh, refill uh, Europe's uh, gas storage levels with with some decent uh, price instead of having these really elevated prices. What what this means is um, if we we try to uh, try to split this into the near term, um, the current gas storage supplies um, plus the the LNG send out that has increased significantly over the past few months plus the existing supplies from Norway and, um, you know, our Europe's uh, dwindling but still significant uh, production, um, those supplies should make up for, for, for enough um, gas this winter in case Russia decided to curtail, um, curtail flows even further. Although we don't see that as likely given that Europe's, um, it's Russia's main export market in terms of gas um, but that, that's how we cover the bases. Looking into further out uh, after the end of this winter, yes, it would be very hard to, to balance the market again uh, without uh, incremental supply from Nord Stream 2. Um, and any further cuts to current levels would uh, exacerbate this uh, significantly. Oh, thank you very much, Patricio. Uh, the next question is uh, over to you, Grant, on the commodities. And uh, if supply links from Russia to Europe or the West more generally are cut, could they be replaced um, from other sources? Uh, would China step in and fill in the demand and from those regions? And could the West source commodities elsewhere? So to answer that question, I guess it's, it, it varies from commodity to commodity. So uh, as one example, we've seen uh, the European steel makers, particularly Pust Alpine, ArcelorMittal, struggle because um, you, the Ukraine supplies quite a lot of high-grade pellets, important to produce high-grade steel with low emissions. Um, now, there we could see some replacement. So Ukraine is about 4% of the high-grade pellet market. And yes, we could see some, some supply coming from elsewhere, be it, be it um, Brazil and Vale. So there, there are options. But I have to say, in, in a lot of instances, they're quite limited. Um, so when I talked about nickel and aluminium, the dynamics in those markets mean that it's going to take a long time for the West to, or outside of Russia to compensate for that. So nickel, the places to look are the Philippines, uh, New Caledonia, Canada. But again, to bring anything online takes a minimum of three years, sometimes even 10 years. So the short, in the short term, there's an issue. Over the medium term, yes, it can ultimately be replaced. Um, but it's uh, particularly in, and, and you saw Rob's uh, Rob's slide there. It was, it's much quicker to put up a, a wind farm than it is to to build a new mine. 
Uh, thank you, Grant. And on that, Rob, I see there's a few questions popping up for you. Um, what is the likelihood that Europe cancels carbon allowances, uh, trying to bring down the gas and obviously change the supply and demand of that dynamics? Great question. I think the politics of doing that will be quite challenging. That being said, we are in an unprecedented crisis at the moment, so maybe it's the kind of thing that could be considered, but I, I haven't seen any serious proposals. And if you look at where the EU is at when they talk about carbon allowance prices, many, many of them are talking about floor pricing and that sort of thing. So not not uh, relieving the price by uh, by by canceling the requirement. So uh, my sense is that you, climate is a multi generational problem. It takes many decades to kind of sort out. And so even if there's some push to use more coal in the near term and perhaps provide some relief, I doubt the medium term, long term goals get relaxed. And I'll just quickly address to uh, Roger, there were a number of questions in the chat on hydrogen, and I would just say hydrogen is a great part of the story. If you want to know more about our views on that, you can check out BI Basket, B-S-K-T, go to see our hydrogen theme basket for companies that are exposed to that idea, who are working on it. And uh, if, if, if you're following the hydrogen story, it's uh, – it's it's a very piece of the very interesting piece of the European ecosystem. Next generation EU funding has put is putting a lot of money to work in hydrogen over the next few years. But th this is a not a quick lead time kind of thing. I think we're still quite experimental with hydrogen, but it could be an important part of making renewables. Uh, dispatchable, essentially, right? So renewables are intermittent. We know they've got to get paired with something. The question is, are they going to get paired with hydrogen? Are they going to get paired with nuclear? Are they going to get paired with maybe even carbon capture and storage? Th there's going to be other things in the mix. Hydrogen could be the answer. And so check out our theme basket to really understand which companies are exposed to that idea. Yeah, thank you, Rob. I see there's a few, interestingly, a few crypto uh, questions crept in. Uh, Mike McGlone is our crypto analyst based out in the U.S. So I'll put a lot of those questions. I don't know if any of the team uh, feel brave enough to take a stab at them. Rob, I see you laughing and Grant's just turned on his camera. So I was expecting these two guys to stand up here. The pressure is on. <laughs> okay, so crypto is not – I'll – Raise my hand. It's not my area of expertise, but I think uh, there is an argument that gold and and cryptocurrencies are are, are particularly are different. So so gold behaves as a as a, as a uh, buffer, uh, as a as a, a a safe haven, and crypto doesn't doesn't hasn't behaved like that. The volatility is much higher. It's probably something you should invest in if you want to really juice up your portfolio, not as a as a safe haven. I think that's it. And also, I think somebody made the comment in the chat that it's um, in times of crisis, people look to to areas which offer liquidity. And I think that's what we're seeing today is is you know a, a chase for liquidity to get some cash, covering positions, etc. So I think that's why, um, as yet, we're not seeing a cri cryptocurrency become a safe haven. And I don't think anybody has expected it to, to quite behave like that. And Rob, do you have a thought here to share? I think that sums it up well. <laughs> um, I do see there's a few questions on um, financials. Uh, so unfortunately, Thomas has had to jump, so we can certainly come back to them. And then, uh, Tim, I think there's a question on the stocks. Yeah, yeah, it's actually about the stocks bank, okay. which is why I hopped back visible. Um, it, and I think this is this, I think this is pretty straightforward. Um, if you think about bank stock relative performance and the bank stocks, the the, the, six, the stock six hundred bank sub index relative performance, um, it ties very closely with what's going on with um, interest rates. And specifically, if you were to chart um, this index relative to the stock six hundred. And compare that to um, the generic 10-year 
uh, bond yield, you'd find very close uh, tracking from the standpoint of when bonds go up, bank stocks go up, and vice versa. And and the reason is twofold. One is uh, it gives you a sense of improving net interest margins, uh, at least the possibility of that. Um, it's been a big piece of why we've had a favorable um, uh, sector exposure towards banks and financials over the course of the past couple of quarters, looking at you know, what seems to be a likely upward trajectory. Um, and with today's issues putting some doubt on how aggressive central banks, whether that be the ECB, BOE, or even the Fed, um, may be in terms of tightening or renewing QE and going to QT, I think it, 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 it makes sense that banks would underperform today. As we go from here, they're still cheap. Um, if this solves itself and calms to a degree and central banks remain on um, a, a trajectory of, of some snugging, um, we still probably have a modest upward trajectory in, uh, in interest rates to a degree. Others will, will pontificate on that element of things, but that continues to give us a backdrop for banks, but not today. Okay, thank you very much, much Tim. Uh, one final question, uh, probably Grant and Tim, you might both come at it, is gold selling pressure if Russian Central Bank decides to start selling down gold to raise liquidity? I'll give that to Grant. Yeah. <laughs> no, we have seen that before. That's a, that's a very fair question. So, so the initial reaction um, to any crisis when people need a lot of liquidity is we have sometimes seen gold selling off. So we've seen it during the global financial crisis. And we saw it at the very early start uh, of the COVID crisis. Um, now, but then what happens is over time, then gold sort of um, starts to outperform. Um, so that is a potential. And the point on, on Russian central bank gold reserves is a one well made. So Russia has been accumulating gold. And that's really to diversify away from the dollar um, as, a, as, as a reserve um, asset. Um, now, it's, it's still relatively small, but, but certainly that is, a, that is a risk. But I would argue that a lot of other banks or a lot of, a lot of other central banks might continue to accumulate. And certainly surveys that the World Gold Council have done suggest that there will be continue, uh, continual purchases of, of, of gold as an asset. But Russia, Russia liquidation does present a short-term risk. Okay, well, thank you very much. I think on that note, we will conclude today's event. Thank you very much for everybody's participation and especially your questions. Thank you to the BI team for your excellent presentations. We will send out the slides after this. The event has been recorded, so if you signed on late, I've heard a few people that had some issues at the beginning. Let me know, and I can uh, send out the recording along with the slides. And then finally, just to say, the whole team are here and welcome your engagement. So please reach out, and let's continue the dialogue. Thank you very much.